You're listening to Autism Outreach Podcast, a podcast full of ready-to-use strategies to help those with autism strengthen their communication skills. Here's your host, Rose Griffin of ABA Speech, a speech therapist and board-certified behavior analyst who shares tips you can use in your next therapy session. Welcome, everyone, to the Autism Outreach Podcast. I'm your host, Rose Griffin, and today I wanted to share with you my top five mistakes I have made over the past 20 years helping to serve autistic learners. I am a speech language pathologist and a board certified behavior analyst. I became a speech therapist first. I did that for about 10 years and was working solely with autistic learners worked in an ABA center and learned all about applied behavior analysis and became a BCBA. So I've been certified about 12 years. There are less than 515 of us in the world, which I'm something I'm super proud of. And today I wanted to come on and tell you the top five mistakes that I've made over the course of my career. We've all made mistakes and I want you to learn from me, whether you are somebody who is just getting into the field, whether you are somebody who is a seasoned veteran in the field, We have all made mistakes. So I want to air them out for you so that you do not make these same mistakes. And today, I'm sure I could share more, but today I'm sharing my top five. Number one, the number one mistake that I made when working with autistic learners is working on yes, no questions too early. This is such a very hard skill. And I remember I was working in a public school program, but it was for autistic learners. And it was a school in a county. And so if students had higher support needs, they were sent to us in this specialized program that was housed within a public school, which was amazing because then we could work on inclusion, reverse inclusion opportunities. A lot of these students were not yet speaking or were emergent communicators. This was, oh, this is really long time ago, maybe 17 years ago. And I was using my standardized speech therapy test. I was not a BCBA yet. And the VP map hadn't come out. That is not the end all be all, but it is a tool that's really helped me in goal setting for my students. And I was creating goals based on development, my expertise, standardized testing. And I had many students who had yes, no goals. And so the goal would be I would hold something up and I would say, Do you want this? And they would say yes or no. This is a really hard skill. And I worked on those goals. I actually had an assistant at the time. We also worked on those goals. And I came to find out after taking data and analyzing it, that that is really a hard and higher level language skill for students. And so if I could go back and whisper in my ear and tell myself, don't write those goals, I would have instead had a focus on shared activities, joint attention, and I would have had a focus more on requesting. So if a student wanted something uh, that they would be able to spontaneously initiate and engage to request something instead of saying yes and no. Is yes and no important? It is, but it's a higher level language skill. Something to think about if you're working with autistic learners and thinking about those foundational skills. I talk about that a lot and start communicating today. Um, Help Me Find My Voice, my school-age autism course is getting a bit of a revamp. It'll be available through uh, December 2023 if you're listening to this in real time. And then we are going to give it a facelift um, for the school-age learners. So number one mistake, do not work on yes, no questions unless your student has more language, because it is a more advanced language skill. Number two, second mistake I made is not setting enough specific goals for joint attention. I talk about joint attention a lot. And anytime I discuss it on the podcast or we do a webinar, we get thousands of downloads and we get thousands of views from parents and professionals. I used to have a talk 10 years ago, 12 years ago called the power of manding, which is a jargon word, the power of requesting. They're not interchangeable, but for our purposes today, I now have a talk the past two years, the power of joint attention. 
social engagement, shared activities are the absolute cornerstone and foundation for language, for helping all autistic learners find a way to spontaneously communicate with the world. Now, did I incidentally work on joint attention and shared activities and child-led activities, et cetera, et cetera? I did. I did because I'm a speech therapist and a BCBA. I feel like that is my jam. I do that. It's what I do. But I didn't write specific goals for joint attention. If you've taken the power of joint attention or start communicating today, my larger course, you know that we have a three-step framework. I'm all about making things easy because I know that your job as a speech therapist, teacher, BCBA, parent is a lot. And I love a framework. So we talk about working on joint attention with a three-part framework. How can we work on shared activities? By using books, by using music, and by using play. And how can we interchange those activities so that we're introducing them to our student and we're working on the skill of joint attention? So very important. I would urge you, if you were in early intervention, If you are working with toddlers, preschool age students, like so many of us are, with the incidence rate of autism now being one in 36, we are supporting autistic learners. And we really need to learn about joint attention if we don't know much about it. And we need to start applying those strategies to our sessions. And you will see a difference. You will see your students engage, be excited to attend therapy and be ready to communicate on their own. So if I could go back, I would tell myself, write more goals for joint attention. Now I do, and you can see this in our Autism IEP Goal Bank. I'll include some of these links in the show notes that I've been discussing. And I talk about how do we goal set for joint attention. I may have one overarching goal about joint attention. Let's say a student is able to engage for one minute and maybe this is for insurance and we want it to be five minutes. Or let's say we're school-based and we want it to go up to eight minutes. Whatever makes sense for your student and where they're at baseline. Baseline, so very important. And then the three objectives usually look like how will we use books, music, and a play-based activity to work on that social engagement. So very important for our students. That's number two, the second mistake. Okay. On to number three. You may have seen this if you've been following my work for the past six years. That's when ABA Speech was created out of my idea for the Action Builder Cards. Using jargon type words. Oh, when I first became a BCBA, I felt so excited about being duly certified that I used a lot of jargon type words. I would use them on my Instagram. I would use them probably when I was, I don't even know, making goals. I don't even know if I put the word manned in a goal. I hope I don't, didn't. But nobody knows what those words mean unless you're a BCBA. If we're a BCBA and you see me and I'm presenting at an ABA conference and we're having a chit chat or I'm talking to my my nerd herd, as we call it, the unicorns, the other duly certified people that are in my life, I love to use jargon type words. But when I'm in a meeting, when I'm writing an IP, when I'm presenting to people who are not in the field of ABA, I do not think. And ethically, the BCBA code says we need to use language that is understandable by all. And I think this really goes for speech language pathologists too. And I'd really have to look at our code to see ethical code to see if it says anything. But we all, both sides, FBA, DRO, SD, MLU, BIP, IEP, (laughs) LRE, I could go on and on and on. But when you are a parent or you are a professional and you hear a word in a meeting and you are not sure of the meaning of that word, I don't know about you, but I start to feel defensive and I start to feel less than and I start to feel like I should know what that word means. I quietly sit here and then when I get out of this meeting, I'm going to Google it. And I remember one time I was in this BCBA mastermind. This was six years ago and uh, somebody approached me. We had a small Facebook group and we would meet sometimes to talk about online business because it's, you know, not a lot of people do it. And so you need help and support. And somebody said, I use a lot of ASR in my talks. 
And I thought to myself, well, gosh, I do a lot of talks. I've been doing talks for 10 years virtually and in person. I don't know what ASR means. Maybe I'm not a good speaker. Maybe I'm not a good presenter. She was talking about active student responding. Well, if you've come to any of my talks, you know that I love active student responding. I love to get into the chat. I have a visual on a lot of my slide decks when I'm the presenter for our CEU talks every month at the ABA Speech Connection, our membership. I like to get in the chat. I like to answer your questions. I love to do in-person talks because I like to connect with people. I like people in real life, but I like to use terms that people understand. And so that jargon type term made me feel really defensive because I didn't know what that meant. And it made me feel like, well, maybe, and maybe this is a problem, a me problem, but I felt like, well, I do a lot of presentations. Why don't I know what that term means? So think about that in your own life. Are you using jargon type terms in meetings without even thinking about it? Because if we're in a special education meeting, if we're in a meeting with a certain population of people that are all in our same niche area, they do what we do. Sure, we can throw around those terms and that's completely fine. But using jargon type terms is something that I probably did when I first started in my career and I wish that I hadn't. Now, BCBAs in the code, it says we're ethically called to use understandable language. So if you're in a meeting in a BCBA using all these terms um, and there's a lot of non-behavioral professionals, they really shouldn't be. We should be using understandable language. All right, on to the fourth mistake that I wish I would never have made. But I think that when you know better, you do better. And that's very true. I used to use the term, because a lot of people did, red flags. So there used to be, I actually had a blog post about it. I had a YouTube video that I've since taken down. Now, we would use this term, people would use this term in reference to autism. Oh, well, you know, there's a lot of red flags for autism. Well, that has a really negative connotation. I would never want my client, my client's family to think that having autism is a bad thing, right? Everybody's brain works differently. Everybody's brain works differently. I have a very popular TikToker Ryan and his sister, and I've posted this on Instagram a couple of times, but he has autism and he's conversational and he makes a lot of videos. And he said, autism is not an illness. Autism is not an illness. Are we driven as professionals to help autistic students? We are. And if you're listening, I'm sure that you share the mission that we do at ABA Speech is to help all autistic learners find a way to communicate with the world. But we can use different words. So if, you, if you're if you using the word red flags, well, don't say it again. Don't say it again. I've been saying, and I have autistic adults on the podcast and families who have an autistic individual in their lives, and everybody's going to have a different thought. You might meet somebody and they might say, who cares? I don't care if you say red flags. Well, I want, I think these words that we use are important. And so instead of red flags, I would say characteristics of. If you're talking about a student who you're looking at the signs of autism and you might say, oh, you know, the student has characteristics of autism. So using the word red flags can seem negative. If you're using it, I'm not telling you what to do. You're an adult, but I'm just saying, think about it. Something to think about. I wish back in the day that it wasn't socially acceptable to use that word. And I think the neurodiversity movement, there are a lot of great things that are coming from that because people are pointing out some of the things that we've been doing that are not great, but I think that we can do better. Does that mean if a student has characteristics of autism and you're discussing it or it's important to talk about? Absolutely, because some autistic learners are going to need our support and that's fine. We're not trying to change that person. We're not trying to take the autism out of that person. We want them to hold on to their individuality being a speech therapist in a BCBA, I want all of my students, and I really do, I believe in a world where all autistic learners have a way to communicate. And if that means that they need support sometimes, where my clients need support, I think that's great, and I'm here to provide it. But I would not use the term red flags. All right, on to the last one. Okay. This is a big one. And I know that people have come at me on social media, people I thought were friends, <laughs> um, about eye contact. But I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. 
back in the day, I mean, probably the very start of my career, I might have written goals to work on eye contact. I might have. But honestly, probably in the past 18 years, I have not written a goal for eye contact directly because there are other ways for us to work on that attention goal. There are other ways for us to work on that communicative exchange. And I don't think that eye contact shows that a person's listening. We would never want to shape up strange eye contact. If somebody stares at you and looks at you for too long, how do you feel? How do you feel? Uncomfortable. You feel uncomfortable. So why would we teach our students to do that? Now, if it's a safety concern and you're working on something related to safety, I'm not going to say never write a goal for eye contact because we're writing individualized plans. What I'm saying when I am working on communication based goals, I'm not directly focusing or writing goals for eye contact. I really think eye contact is going to be a byproduct of us creating engaging activities for our students. Is it hard? It is. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Is it hard to create these types of child-led, semi-structured, unstructured, nuanced types of sessions? Absolutely, it's difficult, but it's a muscle. We get better at planning these sessions when we do it. Is it easier for a technician to sit at a table and do discrete trial instruction? It's probably easier to train the staff to do that. It's probably easier for that staff to do that. Is that student going to be happy? No, not if they're two or three. It's probably not appropriate. I'm going to be coming out with a course, at least that's my life plan, um, in a couple of months about naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. We're working on it currently. And I think it will be great. How can we help our students in a natural way. We know that's what the literature says. That's what the research says. Work on joint attention in the environment where these things typically take place. Something that people used to do, and I've seen presenters that I really admire still talk about it to this day, and it's just not how I operate. So it's just a dialogue. It's something to think about. Back in the day, I was taught, if you want a student to look at you, you hold up something preferred to your eye to get them to gaze to you. And I just don't do those types of things anymore. I really think, is eye contact a helpful skill for students? Yeah. Is it something that we can work on by working on joint attention, by working on shared activities through books, music, and play? Absolutely. Absolutely. Can we work on eye contact incidentally when working on requesting? Sure. I have a really fun game This will come out at the end of October. That's with these turkeys and they're magnetic and there's all these different feathers. And so I have a, I have the feather. I give it to the student. They want more feathers to put on their turkey. They're going to gaze up and they're going to look at me. It's a byproduct of our teaching. And everybody could have a different thought on that. This is just my personal opinion after doing this work for 20 years. We all make mistakes. I'm sure that I could interview you at a conference and you would have five mistakes that you'd like to share with people who are newer to the field or newer to supporting autistic learners. I wanted to come on today and start a dialogue about mistakes that I've made. When we know better, we do better. So these are my mistakes. I wish I would not have set those yes, no goals for students who were emerging communicators because it's a higher level language skill. I wish that I would have set specific goals for joint attention. I'm going to link my Autism IEP Goal Bank if you haven't downloaded it. I have some goals there. I wish I would not have used jargon type terms in meetings. I actually have the Intro to ABA and ABA Case Studies courses that you can purchase now. Those are ASHA approved courses. If you want to know what those jargon type terms mean, we go deep on what all that means, because you're going to be in meetings and you're going to hear those words, but I'm not going to use them. Won't be coming out of my mouth. I wish I wouldn't have used the term red flags as a negative connotation. And I wish I would not have worked goals directly for eye contact or held up preferred items to gain eye contact. It really is something that incidentally can be addressed when you're working on shared activities with students. I hope that these have been helpful. I hope that it starts a dialogue. If you don't agree with me, 
you can let me know personally over on my Instagram, slide into my DMs. If you think this podcast episode is helpful, please share it with a friend. We get thousands and thousands of downloads every single month, but I love it when we get new listeners and they've been able to share the podcast with others. If you love the podcast, do me a favor, write me a review. I always love to hear from you and check out abaspeech.org. We have new CEU offerings every single month. We have a new membership called the ABA Speech Connection CEU membership where you get a new ASHA and ACEU course every single month. And every new member gets to book a one-on-one onboarding call with me. I love connecting with you. Remember, until next time, keep things fun and functional. And I'll see ya. Thanks for listening to Autism Outreach. If you enjoyed the show today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode full of actionable strategies you can use in your therapy room. Write a review too. That would mean so much to me. I always love hearing from you. Have a specific topic that you want included on a future show? Reach out over on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, or visit me at www.abaspeech.org.